Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. Welcome, my name is Ruby T. I'm the curator of museum education here at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. Welcome to the Freddie Schiff Levin Lecture Series, which is graciously sponsored by the Levin family. Now in its 21st season, the lecture series honors Freddie Schiff Levin's legacy as a member of the Provincetown arts community by inviting artists, curators, authors, and scholars to speak at PAM. We are grateful to the Levin family for their continued support of this annual program. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we wel welcome exhibiting artist Mira Shore in conversation with exhibiting curator Brian Dunnigan, exhibition curator Brian Dunnigan. Mira Shore is an artist and writer based in New York and Provincetown. She received her MFA from Cal Arts, where she was a member of the Cal Arts Feminist Art Program and a participant in the historic feminist art installation, Woman House. She is the author of Wet on painting, feminism, and art culture, and a decade of negative thinking, essays on art, politics, and daily life, and was co editor with fellow painter Susan B. of the journal Meaning. Shore is the recipient of awards in painting from the Guggenheim and Pollock Krasner Foundations, as well as the College Art Association's Frank Jewett Mather Award for Art Criticism. She is a recipient of the 2019 Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Award for her work as a feminist painter, art historian, and critic and of a 2022 Anonymous Was a Woman Award. Shore is represented by Lyles and King Gallery in New York and Marcel Alix in Paris. In September, her show Mira Shore, Moon Room, opens at the Bourg de Commerce in Paris. Brian Dunnigan is an artist and curator living and working on the Outer Cape. She is a member of the PAM Exhibition Committee and has curated many shows for the museum with a special interest in the art history of Provincetown and women artists. She exhibits her sculpture and prints widely throughout New England and New York. Her work can be found in several public and private collections, and her studio is in Truro. Please join me in welcoming Mira Shore with Brian Dunnigan. Is my mic on? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Um, I want to welcome everybody here. I know you have lots of choices of things to do tonight, and um, I'm really happy to see such a, such a great crowd, and I mean, it speaks volumes to your good taste. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, because I said, Mira, nobody's going to come. They're all going to go see Nina Totenberg. And then she went on to tell me, a story about her family's connections with the Totenberg family. And I thought, I keep thinking, you know, how connected Mira is to so many different things. And my connections with her. And this person that I, whose work I encountered in New York for the first time, and I would see and I was intimidated by in kind of a way. and. It was a while before I realized it was the same person I would see in flip-flops <laughs> <laughs> and dresses, summer dresses in Provincetown, and a uh, much less uh, intimidating figure that I got to know as both a friend and, you know, an amazing artist. Um, I don't know how many of you know how the exhibitions work at this museum, but most exhibitions that come through are proposed through the exhibitions committee, of which I've been a member for probably too many years now. And I've had the opportunity to do some really, really fun shows. And lately my interest really has been in um, women artists. And we propose shows and it usually takes many years for them to come to fruition. And I proposed Mira many years ago now, and our show was kind of, um, had a very particular focus, uh, and as time progressed and things changed in Mira's career, um, 
I really felt like the focus of the show needed to be much broader than we had originally proposed and really good, give a good overview of the career of, of Mira. And what you see in this show is artwork that Mira did, with the exception of one painting, she did in Provincetown, which is, you know, I look at Mira and I think, she would agree, sort of a spiritual home for her and also some of the most um, productive times that she has as an artist are, are here in her little studio, which you'll see some pictures of hopefully, that is just a true inspiration. It doesn't take a big old studio to make beautiful, beautiful work, you will see. And I hope you've all enjoyed the show. I told Mira I was gonna, talk 1% and make her talk 99%, <laughs> but hopefully it will be a good conversation. I just want to take an opportunity to thank Chris McCarthy so much, who has been so supportive <laughs> of, of this exhibition and given us, you know, everything we asked for, and um, I just want to acknowledge that with great gratitude. So. And Mira's very good at talking about her work, and hopefully <laughs> we can. I'm up. So I'm going to stand just because I feel like standing gives you more energy. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's a great audience. And um, thanks to Chris and to Brian. Um, yeah, we, this, uh, 10 years ago, I curated a show of my parents' work. A uh, particular body of my parents' work here um, at the Art Association, and there's a catalog in the bookstore that you can see. I called it Abstract Marriage, sculpture by Ilya Shore and Rosha Shore. And that same summer, I s wrote a series of blog posts. At the time, I was sort of active on a blog I had called a, a, a Year of Positive Thinking, and um, it occurred to me at that time that since I have been working in this studio for over 50 years, at that time it was more like 43 years, there were certain days that would reoccur, and I date my work often by the day, so I might have done a work in like July 11th, 1973, 1981, you know, 2010, and I thought it would be interesting to bring those together. But it, because I've done so much of my work here, like in the two months roughly that I spend out of the year in Provincetown, I've done at least half of my overall production. And that came to, I haven't counted it, but let's estimate around 1,500 works. It may be more than that, because a lot of work is, has been on paper, so I, you know, and some, years I've done a lot more work than others. So it became unwieldy to do. So in the end, we, we came up more with somehow representing the passage of time and different phases in the work. For what I've done tonight is that I've, first of all, I will show you my studio, sort of where I work, how I work. And then I put the works that are in the show in chronological order. I don't intend to talk at length about those works, but I may stop to say something. You're welcome to ask questions if you want. What I'm going to do in particular is to insert works that didn't, that aren't in the show, to, you know, that are part of this time continuum and um, that I feel are, uh, I miss them or that, you know, they, they would, it would have been great, but there were many reasons why it was difficult. A lot of the work that I did into the 80s was on rice paper, and a lot of it is very fragile. Some of it is sculptural. So, it, you know, 40 years ago, I would have just pinned it to the wall, but I can't really take that chance uh, anymore. So, um, so when I come to, so I, 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 my mother and father first came to Provincetown in the summer of 1957 with me and my sister. So I was, to age myself, I was seven. And, um, and I, I, I mentioned this at the uh, opening of my show, but my sister was at, older sister was at camp, and my mother wrote her letter in French and said, Mira se sent bien dans sa peau ici. Mira feels good in her skin here. And I, I, I think there was a sense of freedom that I had here that I don't find in other places. I could play on the beach, the sense of sky. I really loved this place. And then my mother bought a house in 19, 
the first summer we were in the house is 1970, so that makes it, this is my 53rd summer in the house. So every summer, so I work basically in, a, in what had been like a guest room. It's on the way to the bathroom, and for years <laughs> I would have studio visits, and finally after about like 45 years, I thought, every studio visit, the toilet has just been like right up front <laughs> in people's line of vision. <laughs> Um, but the first thing I do is um, I put up a postcard wall and I don't change the postcard wall, but I take it down at the end of the year and then put it back up so they won't fade, you know, they'll last longer. And once the postcards are up, I don't necessarily look at them that much, but somehow they're there, uh, the works and the photos that are on there are part of my like, spirit world or something, or, you know, and then I just painted a table. This is one of the oldest postcards on the wall. It's a detail from Schacht Cathedral. And I feel like all I need to do is look at this. And then I have a picture of Buster Keaton below, and it's the same face. <laughs> um, and then I also have uh, Mr. Spock, which is the same face. So somehow this person, very serious person, is, is looking at me in triplicate. Um, my, when, when we... Uh, came to the house, my mother made her own studio in essentially the boiler room. I mean, the hot water heater is in there. It's sort of like an everything catch-all shed type of space. It's the oldest part of the house. And after she died, I felt that I could not leave her desk, her work table empty. So I started to draw there. So the sketches that are in the show were done at that table. and. And in recent years, I've actually done a fair amount of work down there for, I don't, it's incredibly cramped, but somehow I feel at home there too. So I've also put postcards up there. Um, so in a way, I'm actually working in the whole house, but none of it is con a conventional studio space. But there are other places where I do sketch <laughs> and, um, the summer of 2019, I w it, in the fall, I was going to have a studio at the Sharp Walentis Foundation in Brooklyn. Um, and I, was, I applied because I thought, all right, I'm getting older. I want to try to do some very large work, a single canvas very large work, instead of other kinds of large works I've done that are multi you know, made up of smaller parts. And I, I needed to practice, like how, how do you bump up you know, to, to person size scale? So I, one, one day I, I did two big drawings in the, the sand flats right in front of, sort of just off from St. Mary's of the Harbor. And um, so you see my little feet. Um, <laughs> and I don't have the picture of the dog that came up. Like, oh, okay, what are you doing? Um, so these, I don't know how well you can see these, but um, I, one is just the wall in the studio, which has uh, its 1950s wallpaper that the person who we bought the house from had used. We were New York white wall people, um, modernists, but whatever wallpaper she used, I adore, and so does Brayon, who's, who's lifted a little bit of it for, for her <laughs> own, own work. And um, so I, one of, the, one of uh, the things about this show is that there's some paintings that somehow never leave Provincetown. Usually at the end of the year, I manage to get you know, work up to, um, back to New York, down to New York. Um, but there are works that stay either like the self-portrait, which is in the show, it just didn't dry because it's like 100% stand oil. And um, other works, I don't really know why they stay, but they stay. Um, so the painting of Fog, and then um, the painting that I th think is now titled Leftover of a Something War, I've forgotten. It was written on the back of the canvas. And I've always, it's from 1990 or 91. It was the first Iraq war, I think. Yeah, it was done a, a, right after the first Iraq war, which lasted three weeks, but inspired about three years worth of work for me. <laughs> and um, 
I don't know why it kept on staying here, and then somehow I think, okay, I need, really need to bring it to New York, and you know, somehow it, it wouldn't uh, leave. There's a, a drawing that stayed on the wall for a long time um, that is part of a larger group of work that says, are you a feminist artist? So I, I keep on looking at it to, well, what is the answer to that, that question? And, um, and actually, one thing that has stayed is uh, in there, one, um, one summer, my sister Naomi Shore and my mother tried to, my sister tried to write down and create a family tree based on my mother's very excellent memory, not only of her own history, but of my father's family history. And uh, by that time, I, my, my, both my sister and my mother had died. And so I, I had it photographed, I printed it out, and it ends, she ended it with, of all of the people who lived, we were the only, at that time, I'm, it was just she and me, <laughs> basically. I mean, the Holocaust having cut short uh, our lineage, and now I'm the only one who remains. So it's there, you know, I don't really look, I, I thought I did it, and then I thought I was gonna make art from it, and I sort of did, but not exactly. There's the one, there's a piece, one of the sketchbooks says, a life, so I had, I had done things with that. Okay, so here are some works that are not in the show, but that, um, so this is from, I think the summer of 71, it's a gouache on arches paper, and uh, we just had an incredible moon, like a moonrise like this about 10 days ago. Absolutely, so I did not imagine these scenes. And I've, one of the things about, that's been very important to me about Provincetown, it's not the only influence, in, you know, because there's a huge historic, art historical backing to, to what I do, and there's a, the, city, the New York City energy and forms. But, I think Provincetown contributed to my finding things in nature that I could also then apply to other things, like forms that could then become other forms. Um, and uh, that's not necessarily an exact example of that, but I think it does have something to do with this really important connection that I feel with the landscape here. And I'm sure, I know I'm not the only one in this room that, that has that feeling. Um, and it's changeability and yet familiarity at the same time. Okay, this, this is in the show. This, this represents a whole body of work that I did after I uh, got my MFA, where I began to cut down from the rectangle to the thing itself, like whatever the subject would be, so a more sculptural direction. And there's definitely, um, in my 30s when I was, so this, I did this, I was 24, it's a, and you can see it's a small piece. But especially at the, at the end of my 20s and my early 30s, I, would, I felt more pressure to start defining myself to an art world that was changing. And I would think of, okay, I'm, I'm a painter for whom sculpture is at the core of my work, or I'm a sculptor who's a painter, or I'm an architect who couldn't go to architecture. I, you know, whatever it was, it, 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 there's, the, I feel very committed to painting, but also I feel a connection to thingness. I think that's, and I did paint, there isn't a, a thing painting, but I've painted the word thing. Um, so this is also work that's, that, that I was talking about it being very delicate work, um, so following the small dresses, I, I, in the mid-70s I worked primarily with rice paper, which is very, a very interesting material, very fragile, but actually also has quite a lot of tensile strength to it, and worked a lot with layering, and these are just two examples. You can see, again, my, my shell wallpaper, and um, most of these works are two-sided, and have text on them. And the text is because I used a material that made the paper translucent. You, a lot of the text is actually backwards, but you can see that there is text. Can, and, can, yeah. <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about what the significance of the, the dress is yeah, to you? Thank you, Bran, because I would have steamed right past that. <laughs> I have notes in here saying, talk about 
femininity. Okay. <laughs> um, so, well, so first of all, I, wa I did, um, when I went to graduate school, it was just at the beginning, or the height beginning of the wave of second wave feminism, women's lib, it was like, and I decided to be in the feminist art program, I was only in the program for, you know, one school year, worked on Woman House, and I was very interested in the, well, I was, I was interested in the notion of femininity, and um, maybe this is a good point to tell an anecdote where I, I think at, around this time in, in the sort of early-ish 70s, I got a questionnaire. I, some woman, you know, young woman was doing uh, sociology work and she sent a questionnaire to women artists and it was one of those typical psycho, you know, tests where it's like, just, just check every adjective that you feel you know, you connect to. And of course, there, well, a lot of them were contradictory in nature. So I'm like, you know, clicking along, going, it was sort of fun. And then I get to feminine, I stopped. And I yelled down to my mother, mommy, am I feminist? <laughs> I mean, no, sorry, that, that's an interesting uh, little, you know, Freudian slip. Mommy, am I feminine? And she writes, of course you are, she calls up from downstairs. So I clicked. You know, I, I wrote, uh, no clicking those days. I checked off feminine and unfeminine. I don't, I think I did both. That, that moment is an important one because I, um, I felt it was a strange notion and I felt that femininity was something that you could take, put on or take off. And the dress was a symbol of that. And so I began to do dresses without the person in it, but just the shape of the dress. And it became, you know, it turned into these life-size dresses. And there were interesting reactions when I did these. I, I, at that time, I was uh, teaching at a school uh, in Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And I was doing some of these rice paper dresses, and I had one up, and this one male student said to me, that he, he was very open about it. It wasn't a hostile reaction. He, it was, he said, you know, it's a really aggressive act in a way that you're doing by putting this into my space. You know, basically that I was intervening into space, which meant in a sense male space, with these extremely fragile feminine works. And he was seeing the sort of edge that in a way was also a very as aggressive, assertive act. And I, I had other conversations around this kind of, of work. Um, so, and there's, a, there's a, a slight connection to my interest when I was a teenager in fashion design and in the history of fashion. And I always say that it's, a, it's really lucky that a lot of the history of painting is of people wearing clothing because it, I, I looked at a lot of books on the history of costume, which were largely populated by paintings, you know, of people wearing incredible costumes, and that, that kind of got me through my teens. Another work that I would really like to have in here represents the transparency duality factor, um, but the, the, my uh, gallerist from New York, Isaac Lyles, is here, and we, we have, um, we had found a, a framer to do two-sided <coughs> frames, and then somehow in the pandemic he disappeared into the great world, and we've never seen him since, and it's been hard. Uh, so um, we, I didn't have time to do that, but what this um, work says is Persephone didn't want to go to hell, um, and, and you see it from both sides. So it, I made the, the rice paper with the medium that I used on it became transparent. And the language would be there. So the other thing after the dress is the language has been a very important part of my work in and out throughout the years. Um, when I started to do these works was the point where, I don't think young people deal with this issue anymore, but when I was a kid, you want to find your own handwriting. Like to grow up, you're going to have your own handwriting. And the moment where I had that, I thought it's beautiful. It's slightly, it's pretty illegible, but it's also a beautiful 
visual element. And I was already interested in representing language or text, and that's when my handwriting and using my handwriting came into to the picture. Um, so, and the Persephone reference is also just that I thought, well, I have this strange you know, life where I spend summers with my mother, which I did until I was in my, you know, until she died. And then I go back to New York. It's not really that I'm going back to hell, but there is an, a hellish aspect to New York <laughs> <laughs> that's different than, than being, uh, you know, with, and I love New York, but it, then, and different than this sort of, the, fem, the female power of our house with my older sister Naomi also to just, all these you know, women who were doing work that was really interesting. But a lot of it was with just me and my mother. Um, the, I did a series of masks at this time in the year, in 1977. This was a mask that I did here. This, this is, a, it's a little hard to see that you're looking at front and back, just the quality of the, the pictures isn't. So in, in the masks, the writing might be legible or completely illegible, or, or in my case now, I had to reverse some of the pictures on my computer in order to read what I'd actually written because it was the only other way to see it was backwards. Um, I, um, I'm going to be showing these, uh, a group of 21 masks and two dresses and a recent painting at the Bourse de Commerce in Paris in September. So I'm very excited. They're having them framed in two-sided frames. They're, they're really giving incredible attention to this work. So it's going to be really interesting to show them to a much bigger public than and, you know, I've, I've had access to. Um, and oh dear, okay. This is hard, but let me see if I can. I can't quite read it, but it says something like, there are very few pleasures. Um, and I, I literally can't, oh, maybe I can read it if I get up close. Sorry. Yeah, here I can read it. There are so few pleasures, being eye level with the high tide, looking out at the clouds, a soft breeze on a tan. So that was uh, summer of 77. So it's a Provincetown uh, mask. So front and back. Some of them were like books also, literally you could turn the pages of the mask, but that's very hard to exhibit publicly. We're getting to a painting that's in the show that's based on um, a series of postcards that I did at that time. So this is front and back. It was a dream of, uh, it was a dream of an experience which actually I just had because I was telling the story today of being on a sailboat rounding the Cape in beautiful weather and the person who, this actually wasn't a dream, it was a real thing that happened. We, we were going around and she was, the, the, the hostess said, oh well we've had all kinds of experiences today except, and then she stopped because she didn't want to say anything bad. And the minute she said it, this, we were in the middle of a wild storm and I was the only crew and her husband who I'd known since my childhood started barking at me to like grab the foresail and do the, this and I was afraid I was going to go over. So this postcard um, says, but then suddenly came a storm and maybe disaster. So the painting suddenly that's in there is taken from that. I reversed it, I blew it up into large you know, photographs, whatever the technique was at that time. And that led to this painting, of which, and there are only three suddenly paintings. Um, and, this, and, and one thing that's interesting about this painting is that this was meant to be the underpainting. In other words, I started, it's just like, you, you'll see, it's just charcoal and oil, and it was, it was supposed to be more. And I was like, okay, suddenly the painting happened already and there's nothing more I can do to it. Um, so I'm gonna move to, through the, 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 this painting, um, Low Tide, and these represent a whole series of hundreds of works on paper done over about a five year period, very much based on the landscape here and also um, a, a number of other landscape experiences that I've had and, but it, formally, I feel like the forms then occur in other works. So to me, 
I don't, it's been a little hard for me at times to explain to people like, okay, I did this and then I did that because people tend to think of an artist as doing one thing. Um, I'm super excited to have this in the show because I had not seen it for years. It's been in storage, Auto Portrait by Venus. It's a format that I was doing of doing work, larger works in smaller increments or you know, parts. And it's somewhat related to having come upon this incredible dead skate on the beach after a very big storm. And I, I, that yielded a lot of work. And this one is, is somewhat, it had an incredibly human, it has a lot of orifices, skates, and they're very, and little eyes, and they, they look like people in a way. This was a work that Brian and I really wanted in the show, Life of a Spinster. I have no idea where it is. So that is why it's not in the show because when I, I thought it was, I thought I knew where it was in my storage in New York and I, I assume I have it but I don't know where it is. And also it has, the center part is on rice paper and I, I usually I, I stored things carefully but I have no idea visually exactly how I stored it. So I hope I find it um, and it's about, it's the same height as the multiple canvas pieces in there. This is in the show, um, forms part of a whole group of works where I use breast, ear, penis basically as sort of like these gendered body parts that could then be shifted around and, and then, you know, play comes into it. So there are a number of works where the breast is excreting a sunny side up egg. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> See, it made sense to me. Um, And um, pretty much in the 90s to about two, for about 12, 13 years, I only represented language in painting. There, were, there was no imagery, there was no landscape. And, um, and at that point, w often the language, there was a whole group of works that had to do with what I actually did, writing, painting, trace, drawing, so there we have a number of those in the show. Okay. Can I and, just ask yeah. you a question? Because you just said in painting, were you still drawing? Yeah, I did. I the, did draw the, during that time, and the drawings were language too. It's just like there were. Okay. Once I'm doing something, that's what I'm doing, and I'm not, you know, like painting from nature or something right. just to relax. Um, and these would. The, the, here, I was interested in the idea of replicating, sort of like handmade mechanical reproduction. So uh, in, in this case, I just was doing this freehand. In some cases, I would um, write something out just like on a piece of paper and then Xerox it. In the old days, I would do it in Xerox until it blew it up to see each letter large. And um, that those paintings are not really represented in the, the show. And, and, and also, one thing, the other thing that, you know, has, shifted over the years is the impact of, of, of what was happening in the art world. So I was part of the feminist movement. I, I, when I taught in Halifax, I was connected to European conceptual art that was very influential there. It's the first time I heard about Joe's Boys. I can't say, I'm not saying I understood everything, but it, it definitely was an influence. And, um, and in the 80s, uh, the 80s was one of the biggest transformations in culture, I think one of the most nefarious ones and that we're living in now in a sort of fascist age. And it begins the day that Ronald Reagan was elected. Um, and, but the art world also changed. And it ha so during the 80s, there was a tremendous interest in appropriation from culture, but appropriation from pop culture or things that one kind of despised rather than love, let's say. And also there was a big, big change in the language that was used to write about art and the references. So all, so all of a sudden you really had to get up to speed. And things that if you were not in school age were difficult to do. It was difficult to read French psychoanalytic theory or Hegel, which I, I did not do that. 
Um, but I, I did not go there. But, but I did, you know, I tried. I tried to read what I could of the Frank, about the Frankfurt School. I picked and choose, and I started to write because I, that's when I entered. So then I had a really a dual practice. My books are in the other room. So it was kind of ironic. I was writing, and I also was painting writing for a, a, a serious period of time. So this is drawing and then seeing the word raw coming out of, of that and wing. After my mother died, at first I couldn't do any language. That was, I felt like there were no words. Gradually, that um, uh, diagram that I showed you of, of my family, I thought a, a life, a life, a life. You know, all of these were lives. All these names were lives. Um, and uh, so and this is kind of like the Rokeby Venus. Is that the painting with you know looking at the mirror of a life and it's in back. Uh, Life in the Mirror. This is based on a drawing I did when I was 10, which I'm doing a lot now. I'm working with the drawings I did when I was 10. And there is this thing where a kind of a medieval princess is looking at a little house on a table. So this is my house in Provincetown, symbolically, on my table. And it's really a drawing on, on gesso on canvas. So it's, it's bringing drawing together with the painting surface. OK, this is work that's not in the show. Um, I did two series of large figurative works on tracing paper, super fragile. Um, so this was the summer of 2016. Um, these were shown in LA, but I had had a previous show uh, in New York. Of s these are taller. I had shorter ones. Excuse me, what was the medium that you drew was on the tracing paper? Trace, um, ink and gesso on the back. So the gesso, the white of the gesso kind of gives emphasis to what you see on the front. Yeah. So when you, when you did these, did you do them in your living room there? I did, did these you? in the boiler room. In the boiler yeah, room. Yeah, right, room. Okay. <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> but they were, I put them all out at the, you know, because I would just do them and then lay them someplace else. Yeah. A friend of mine was here and took pictures of, of these. I think they're kind of fun. Since Trump was elected, oh, I'm getting, okay, to speed up, done a lot of political work about Trump. A lot of it has not been seen, basically, like hundreds of works, plus I do these New York Times interventions. So that's what these are about. I did this after seeing Wonder Woman here in Provincetown. I actually really enjoyed it. And uh, so, um, and this is the dilemma of the artist, basically. Can you do both? Can you do both in the same place? Uh, do you have time to do both at all? Um, is it actually resistance anyway? Because it's actually very hard to resist real fascism. So we're just in this intermediate phase. Uh, and that, I think, is the last of the images. So my timing was absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, so I hope that Brown can end intervene with questions so and, and questions. I, I would love it if you could just tell, talk to us a little bit about what's going on with you right now and what you're, <laughs> what's happening. You have a show coming up in Paris. Um, yeah, so I had a show in Paris at a gallery called Marcel Alix last September and the I was, very ha I was very happy with the show because in, in a similar yet different way because the scale of the gallery is fairly small. I, I really like the two women who run the gallery because they just were like, yeah, we like the work from the 70s and we like the work that you just did and we putting, we're just putting them all together. And so it was like there was no question. I didn't have to be defensive or explain why I did one and then the other. So. Um, anyway, the work came to the attention of the curator for the Pinot collection, um, and they were, you know, interested in some of the work, and then they came to visit my studio, and um, I didn't, I didn't know what to show, really. I mean, I had to think about what are you going to show in, let's say, an hour. So I took out a number of small works from different time periods on paper, works on paper, just to have to show, and the first ones I had were the masks. And um, 
these, uh, you know, there was a, a very a great interest in the work. So they're, they're showing 21 masks, two-sided frame, so it would be a beautiful installation. Um, two, three dresses, two of which are free, will be in amazing freestanding frames, which has always been my dream to how they could be shown and interacted with by a viewer, um, safe but safely, so the work wouldn't be in danger of just being vulnerable on the wall, unframed. And, um, and, and one painting, which I did not include here, but it's, it's part of the series of the large blue painting that's in the show. It's the same size. And it reflects back on my work at Woman House in 1972, where I did do a large painting Life-size, you could walk into the, this little room, it had been a walk-in closet, and it, ha it was called Red Moon Room, and it had uh, moons at different sort of phases, including a red moon. And so this new painting is the older woman artist. So the, there I was like a young woman, I painted myself, you know, holding my stomach and sort of thinking about periods and stuff and pointing to the red moon. And in the, lit, in the painting done two, you know, two years ago, I'm lying in bed um, and I'm holding up a book set that says Time Spirit, because at a certain point I thought, well, okay, I can't paint the word zeitgeist, that would be pretentious. <laughs> but, but zeitgeist was kind of a word that was really like, people were like, are you part of the zeitgeist? I once had a conversation with my sister here in Provincetown where she was a little depressed and she said, well, you're part of the zeitgeist. I was like, Anyway, so I'm holding up sort of the spirit of my life to the, the red moon, which is the moon that I see particularly well in Provincetown. So I'm very, I find it kind of moving that I'm going to be able to have, show in a way the lifespan of, of a, I mean, I hope there's more to it than, the, <laughs> I hope my lifespan doesn't end with that, but, um, but of, of the young artist, the older artist, and my primary interest in um, something. So I'll end actually with um, something that I wrote a long time ago. And I always need to read it because I don't like to get any words wrong. But so I wrote at a certain point, my agenda um, for my work was established by the time I received my MFA from CalArts in 1973, having spent one year in the feminist art program. I wanted to bring my experience of living inside a female body with a mind into high art in as intact a form as possible. After, in recent years, I started thinking, well, almost every feature of this, every component has drastically changed. High art, okay, that's not a term of a good term at this point necessarily. The female body is, completely transform our idea about you know what it is who has it um, what it means is is very changed but i think the gift that i gave myself were the words with a mind because with a mind allowed me to age as an artist if i if i had stuck i mean there are artists who have worked with the body like joan semmel and allowed them and it, it's given them the the room to age but in a lot of cases you know what what's interesting to the art market, to collectors, to the world in general, is the young female body. And so the fact that when I was the young female body, what really mattered to me was that, first of all, that I was living inside a female body kind of is a weird way of thinking, don't you think? I mean, but it is a significant way that I describe myself. So it's like, and it's like my question to my mother, Am I feminine or not? It's like I inhabit it, I believe in it, but also I, I, it is just a shell for my being, um, like a scene from Star Trek or something. There's some Star Trek things where the spirit of people goes from body to body. There's one in particular where the bodies change gender. Um, and and, um, and that for me, the mind was so important. And as a young woman, I felt that the world did not value the female mind, and that's why I was interested in language, because I felt that women were filled with language, and not just like gossip or whatever the people might think that language was, but actually deep language 
artistic language, et cetera. And, uh, and that that was what I was trying to put into my work and that may also reflect the fact that there are changes in my work because I am not necessarily the same person that I was when I was 21 or 31 or 40 or whatever, that it has to adapt to where I am. The work adapts to my interests, to things that happen in the world and to the changing uh, container <laughs> for Mira Shore. Thank you, Mira. I also want to just thank Isaac yeah. <laughs> from New York, who owns Mira's Gallery, for all his wonderful help getting the artwork here and supporting this exhibition. Well, I, and I want to thank Isaac also because I've, as an artist, I've had a lot of ups and downs. Um, and, you know, to find somebody who's really behind your work and, and really, really has a plan for moving you out into the world gradually has been just a tra life transforming experience that continues, so. Um, so we're hoping for questions. So yeah, we have some time for questions. And if you have a question, I will bring the mic to you so that everyone can hear your question and folks on our live stream can hear your question as well. So just let me know. I see you. A long path to Sorry for the cumbersomeness. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's tons Hold and on. tons of feet of, um, of your, here you go, there you go. Thank you, Mira. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mira. That was such a nice, um, it was really nice listening to you talk about your work. I have, I, th I think I have two questions about the, kind of a similar thing. One is, tactile. I'm really interested in if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the building up of the paint on the surface, so thick, so sensual, and then the distinction between how that, that surface is treated and the way the letters are written or the texture of the letters. Sorry, I didn't get the... The second part, so the tactile oil. Yeah, so the tact, yeah, I'm, I'm really, if you could just talk a little bit about that shift in the work itself, yeah. in texture. And then the second question is kind of related, I think. I agree with you about the, the fascism that we are, that's taken hold, mm -hmm. that has emerged. Yeah. Maybe it's always been there. It's very alive at the moment, as we know. And I'm curious if, since you've been spending so much time with words, is there something that you've noticed that has changed about words and your use of them in, as this, I mean, we're sort of like the frogs in the pot as it's heating up. We are. But I am very curious if, given the breadth of your work now, if you can sense anything different for yourself in your use of language. That's Thank an interesting you. question. Okay, the first part, the, the, the tactility, um, in a way the work is always a metaphor for self, in a sense, so the ch that's the changing self. So the fragility of the transparency of rice paper, the fact that the work was sort of there, but it was, very, it was in your space, but it, was very fra it itself was very fragile and translucent, was one metaphor. And I didn't work in oil until my mid-30s. So I worked exclusively with, with like either the like a pastel and dry pigment on rice paper or, um, or the, the, the works made from rice paper for a good chunk of years. And there was a lot of pressure on me to work in oil, you know, starting with my mother who once called me up and said, I'll, I'll give you $300 if you'll just like paint oil. I was, li I was living in a loft downtown and I was like, I said, well, you can give me the $300, but I'll buy food with it. You know? <laughs> um, 
But I, wor I changed when it was the medium I needed to work with. And then the wonderful thing was then I went through all of the art history that I knew, all the works that I knew, um, and looked at them differently, like not what they represented or the, 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 the composition or form or color, but how do you do that? You know, I go up right up to a Mars and Hartley and just like, how, how was that done? And then I just was crazy about oil paint. I mean, honestly, it was like just like a physical thing. And, and it, it has all these languages. You know, I mean, there, it, you, you can be fatty, you can be thin, you can be dry, you can be flat, you can be, you know. So, so I, do, I do kind of deploy the, the materiality depending on mood or what the subject is, like the underlying subject. And I, I continue to do that. So for example, the black paintings when, and this begin, maybe makes the transition to the, the, you know, our frog moment here, um, frog and boiling water moment. Um, when Trump was elected, I actually already when he was running, I, I just knew he, my life would be shortened because of him. You know, in some ways, just because he's really, he's killing us. One evil, I mean, a spectacularly evil person. You know, it's just, it's, it's really, I mean, Milton isn't around to write about it, but. Um, but I, I thought about a friend who had been brought up in Moscow. She, she lives in the States, but her, her childhood and early, uh, I don't know when she left, maybe 20 or early teens, she said, you know, the thing is when you, when you live in, in a kind of totalitarian regime, you, you actually have no, you have no public life and in a way you have no private life either because there's, there's, you cannot move really. Everything is, is implicated and anything could be a danger. And so you're suffering. So I, I thought, well, what, is, what would be the visual visualization of that sense of space becoming impassable? And that's where I came up with this very thick black, you know, wet paint, oily paint, sort of seeping in and confining language or body in. Um, and so that, you know, I did that for a long time. Now in terms of language, I mean, I think we're all seeing the fact that like words that you thought would matter, like democracy or law or, you know, I mean, just like pretty basics. Or if somebody really doesn't believe, just has absolutely no interest in that, and they have interest in something else, they, they can supersede it, you know. And then everybody, people are sheep, so they begin to like things that were unthinkable begin to happen. And because I am somebody who is the, you know, my parents, I, I had an interesting conversation in my elevator in New York this year with um, somebody said, oh well, I told my husband that you were, you know, had a a Holocaust history or family, something. And I said a Holocaust background because I felt like I, I cannot, my parents were not in concentration camps. They were refugees. They, they, everybody died except them, but they were not in concentration. And that's, it makes a big difference, I feel. But, but nevertheless, on that family tree that I have, everybody who lived into the 1930s die, you know, in the war, and often we don't know where they were even, they just stopped being. And so I, and I, know, I know that your life can be turned upside down and that people begin, can begin to do horrible things out of fear, you know. Um, it's not that hard to, to see how, I, I, what I was brought up with actually was my mother would tell a lot of stories about courageous people. A friend of theirs in particular who was a Polish, er, ergo not Jewish, War, I mean, underground hero who gave his life for, for that. And, I, and then I would think, okay, I can't do that. I mean, I don't, I can't, you know, I, I don't see myself having that kind of physical courage. To, I, I think I would hide, you know, or I would give up somebody. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. So those are, those are very heavy issues that I've dealt with. But now as, as it approaches, also I just want to say that I was a child during the McCarthy era. But I was aware that what my first television experience was to, my parents rented a TV during, to see the Army McCarthy hearings, which I, you know, I was more interested in Hopalong Cassidy. But, um, but I did know that friends of ours had been blacklisted. 
and I met, you know, I mean, I, by the time I was about eight, I really had an understanding of who these people were and what it meant to be black, and the fear the people had to say anything, or to, have, to admit that they'd been part of a club, or, you know, something. So language, you know, how la I think that language becomes meaningless. That's, that's the fear, is that, the, you know, like everything becomes meaningless in, in a truly fascist regime, and also it switches. And that's one of the, I think one of the perils that we're in right now is that the language is being twisted. So it mirrors back at you, but it's the opposite. Like everything that will be said is actually the opposite of, of what is being said. And what can you do? It's very hard to refute. And I can't say that I've really dealt with that in my work. I mean, now that you're, now I'm talking about it, I might, you know, think more about that. So what I've been doing in my New York Times interventions, I mean, I do a lot of different things. Sometimes I just respond. But other times I go for something that the New York Times will do where well, they'll, they'll choose the pussyfooting word rather than the word that is, the new, is really the story. And by doing that, they are complicit and they're doing it out of fear or out of the fact that they're fascists. I'm not really sure. It's really hard to tell. Um, I've listened to the, guy, the owner of the Times now and I can't really tell what side he's on. But I, I'm sure they're quite afraid and they have right to be in a way, but I wish they wouldn't do what they're doing. And it's tiny, you know, it's tiny words, but um, I, I, there's one, I, there's some I don't publish. And there's one, I'm just going to fin finish answering your question, but there's, there's some I don't publish, and one of them was uh, something that had to do with on the waterfront, and the person write, writing it said that at the end, the, all the workers stand behind Marlon Brando's character idle. They stand idle, and I thought, no, they're defiant. Okay, that's like passive worker, angry worker. You don't go for the angry worker, you go for the passive worker. Any other any questions? Sorry, I can, as you can see, I can just go talk and talk. One more question, thank you. And a special one. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to listen to the to your process and your thinking and the evolution of your work. Um, I guess I have so many questions, but it is about language and how, as a writer and a visual artist, how language works for you. Because in your visual works, it's really reduced and it's part of a kind of minimalism of your work mm -hmm. itself. And then when you write, of course, you you know you you develop what you're saying into sentences and in your talks as well. So, you know, there's certain words that then mean a lot of different things. And I was wondering how that also relates to how lang your thoughts about how language has shifted and how words like truth no longer mean truth and, you know, all of that. So there's a, there's a risk in the minimalism of also being misheard or misread. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was, I'm really interested in you know, some of the paintings that have one word and then some of them like this one that have more than one. And I particularly wanted to ask you about the one that has visual pleasure and theory in it and how those relate and, and also the role of theory. But anyway, th those are too many questions, but really about the reduction and the, the expansion when you work as a writer. When I work as a writer, I want to be as clear as possible. I mean, I want to... Um, I want to think about what the responses might be to my argument. I, I uh, like every uh, loft dweller, I was involved with legal battles with a landlord, and so I, I got to testify at a, you know, some kind of a hearing in front of a, not in a court, but uh, with a, a judge of some kind. And our lawyer was like, okay, if the if they ask you, you know, if the, if, the, if the landlord's lawyer asks you a question, like, as few words as possible, you know, say the least possible. And if you're testifying on your behalf, you have to be as clear and thorough as possible. And I, when, I, when Wet came out, um, I wrote to him and I said, you were actually a major influence on my writing because I really felt like I have to construct this argument so it's clear and I anticipate some of the arguments against my own 
point of view, you know, by giving voice, but through quotations or whatever I'm doing. In, in, uh, whereas in the paintings, it's more like the words really are, they, they sort of stand for something bigger, like for a different argument. The, the, one, the, the, the visual pleasure, I did, you know, I was, I, because I was sort of reading all of these, all of these texts, but whatever I, you know, I was reading was, there was a lot of big critique of visual pleasure at a certain point, whether it was the way Laura Mulvey's writings were interpreted. But later, um, oh God, I can't even remember what I might have been reading that summer, Nicolas Bourriot, you know, something like just, so then a word would, come to mind, you know, that would somehow, I would compress my thoughts into it. And also it's like what it looks like, but I'm not interested in how, there, there are some paintings that have a sentence, you know, which is more my own writing, not from. Um, so I'm not sure, I, but again, I haven't painted individual word paintings that I can think of since uh, Trump. So the, the like the there's there's one really I consider an important painting. It's in the book that Isaac published. That's in the in the bookstore, um, where I simply wrote out in in my handwriting, what kind of art will we make under fascism? And then the black it's the black is compressing in. So it was just a declarative question, basically. And the answer is, we're making it already. I mean, we're living in that moment, you know. So you, I do tend to look at work for like, well, why does it, why does, why does this enter the market, and not this? You know, what is it? Who is it feeding? Who is, who, which narrative is it feeding? It makes it difficult as an artist, actually, to because then, of course, I'm, I'm in that system, too. So what does it mean if something actually enters into the system? I don't know. You, you have to make a living, so. You know. That's a weird place to end a talk, but um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that'll be the end. Thank you so much, Mira. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you. And please go look at Mira's show. <laughs> look at the show, look at my books, and... Uh, Thank you for coming. Thank that you. That was really interesting. Thank you.